As many of you know, I read your, your letters and your prayer requests. And many times, I, when I'm reading those letters or whatever you've sent to me, addressed to me, I, I labor with not only taking this to prayer all the time, not just a one time, okay, and I put this down, but keeping this in my heart, as well as how can I comfort and strengthen you? And sometimes, because I, I take these things to heart, I do feel the frustration, because I would like to, for some of you, I'd like to help you and get you, lift, help lift you up and get you out of the mess you're in. And I guess that makes me feel like a mother would feel for her children. I don't care how old you are and how long you've been here. Then I realize that many of you carry, it's a diversity of burdens and issues that you share with me. And I share those burdens because you share them with me, as the Bible tells us, sharing each other's burdens. I pray for God to give me something that would be able to offer comfort to you. But then I realized what good is comfort if you are not empowered to do something in the state you're in. Comfort may only last for a little time. But strength that comes from God's word endures. So my message today has much to do with God and the power of God and the strength of God that is available for every child of God. And I'm going to fulfill that which, in my capacity, The scripture says, the Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. That is actually the Lord speaking to us, but I'm quoting it to you. To give a word that sustains the weary. I would ask you please to open your Bibles to Isaiah 40. Now this chapter, we're not going to, the first part of the chapter I've taught out before. In fact, I think I've taught of many parts of the 40th chapter of Isaiah. But I've made my own translation of this. I'm going to be focusing on verses 12 through 31. And I will read my translation beginning at the 12th verse, which may or may not be exactly the same as the King James. But I have translated it in what I call um, easy to understand. This chapter from the 12th verse on, is knowing God's greatness and his infinite sufficiency. Now, it's normal for us to read something and be detached from it. That's the way our minds work. So I will begin at verse 12. You may follow along your King James Or you may just listen. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Or with the breath of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket? Or weighed the mountains on a scale and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord or instructed him as his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? Surely nations are like a drop in the bucket and are regarded like dust on scales. Surely he weighs the islands as though they were fine dust. Not even Lebanon has sufficient to make fire or enough animals for burnt offering. Obviously the reference there the trees or the cedars of Lebanon, in their abundance, not even that would be enough or enough animals thereof to offer unto God. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are regarded by him as worthless 
and less than nothing. To whom will you compare God? What image will you compare him to? A craftsman casts an idol, overlaying it with gold and fashions it with silver chains. A man too poor to present such an offering selects wood that will not rot. He looks for a skilled craftsman to set up an idol that will not topple. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood since the earth was founded? He sits enthroned above the circle of the earth, and its people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy and spreads them, the heavens, like a tent to live in. He brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of the earth to nothing. No sooner are they planted, no sooner are they sown, no sooner they take root in the ground than he blows on them and they wither, and then a whirlwind sweeps them away like chaff. Now to whom this is this is God speaking, no longer the prophet. We drift between the prophet prophesying and the voice of God speaking right through the prophet, saying, Now to whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? To whom will you compare God? Lift your eyes and look to the heavens, the star-filled heights. Who created these? Who brings out the starry host one by one? and to each he calls by name. Because of the greatness of his powers and mighty strength, not one is missing, that is, the stars in the sky. Why do you say, Jacob, and why do you complain, Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth, He will not grow tired or weary. His understanding no one can fathom. Then at verse 29, He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might He increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Now you could properly understand this, although it's crystal clear, but you could sum up what I've just read by saying what God said in Exodus of himself, I am that I am. Jesus, when he comes in the flesh, will begin to say, and elaborate on that I am. I am the bread of life. I am the way. I am the truth. But the I am in the eternal principles is summed up here in creation. Now, the question perhaps that one might ask is, before we apply this to ourselves, in what context and in what setting was this uttered by the prophet? So these people have been carried away into captivity And they weren't understanding after years and years and years of being there why it should be thus, why it should be so, why has this happened to us. God, surely, as I have an underlying portion of this text, if you will, and that is, I believe in your King James, I'll try and find the verse, that is, surely... In verse 27, my way is hid from the Lord. These people may have been thinking that God had no knowledge of where they were because God was seemingly not responding and not delivering them out of that captivity. We know because we read the whole book that God God declared this would happen to the people. This was not an event unforetold, he said this would happen. And believe it or not, it's hard even for us to fathom that this carrying away into captivity was for the greater good of the people as they, they had become so disobedient. They had not hearkened to the voice of the prophets. They, 
they would not listen. A careful reading of this and a translation which I have done lets us see sometimes how we might approach our situation. My way is hidden from God. Surely God cannot know what's going on. Otherwise, he would hastily enter in to fix the problem, right? But sometimes it is in these most intricate and seemingly complex situations that God is letting something be for his purpose to be made known. What we are inclined to see, the limits of our capacity, or sometimes we try to, we try to push beyond those, but it's, it's simply still in the realm of what we see and not how God sees it. This passage will not only give us a fresh perspective, but if you are one of those today who feels, and I felt this way sometimes, I need comfort, I need strength, I need the, I need the two-for-one thing, that I, if in the back of my memory bank somewhere, I remember when I was a child, when things were crumbling, running to my mother's arms, everything was always okay. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Everything was okay there. Your mother's hug and her care and her words. And as I grow older, I recognize that beyond that which I remember in my mind, there is this passage here that gives maybe greater and beyond what the touch or hug or words of my mother could ever give to me because these are eternal concepts that if taken to the exercising of the soul bring a greater harmony into our life even in the midst of being weighted down and burdened and needing comfort and strength. Now, these people and some people in today's world, when I say this, there'll be people that will go, ooh, I don't like you using that word, but... I'll call it spiritual infidelity. That these people who were carried away were guilty of, and many today are guilty of. They speak with their mouth, but their heart, they speak to God or they speak the things of God, but their heart is far away. And there's abundant reference. I won't even try to quote those references of people's mouth moving, but the heart is far away from God. So when we talk about spiritual infidelity and the things that disturb it, we, we can, our, our minds are disturbed. We can recoil at the thought. But the reality is if we take a spiritual inventory of ourselves at times, we'll find even we are guilty of that. No one remains in the state of absolute faith on the pinnacle of what Dr. Scott used to call amen all the time. So lack of faith distrust, looking at the path we're on and only looking at the path and not seeing the bigger picture, forgetting God's word. It is easy for people to forget that God, creator of all, in fact, I, I underline these and put them in four categories. God is the everlasting God, that means forever, creator of the ends of the earth. It's very easy for us to Forget that in a moment of weakness and being tired and needing strength and comfort. He created it all. He put it all into motion. He spoke it all into being. And then two words, two other words are said of God which will be pivotal for our understanding of the rest of the text. Uh, in your King James, it says, in your King James, it says, Fainteth not, in verse 28, fainteth not, neither is weary. But that is speaking of God. He neither grows tired or grows weary. And if you have to write that somewhere, just in plain English, without the uth at the end, huh, put it somewhere. God never grows tired or weary. So the next time you get tired, remember you and I are not God. God does not get tired or weary. He may get troubled that we have disfaith or apistis or we are backslidden. 
he does not get tired or weary, and his understanding of our human frailties and conditions, no one can fathom. You know, when I was teaching out of the book of Hebrews and we were talking about our high priest who sympathizes, I think I was not even strong enough there to say, if the one who spoke it all into being, who has seen since the beginning of time, surely he, he knows the condition that plagues mankind. He's seen it all. So his understanding, no one can fathom. We can say, yes, God knows, but to the depths of his understanding... We cannot fathom. He's seen it all, and then some. Now, putting that in perspective and our tendency to say that our way is hidden and surely God doesn't know what's going on, let's begin to look at what God gives. He gives power to the faint. I'm going to try and... It's really hard for me to follow notes because I like to write everything and then I like to ignore them. (laughs) But I'm going to try and follow my notes because as as I began to put all this down on paper, I realized there are some very important things that should be followed. So let's first talk about the possible causes of fainting. And please, I want you to clear your mind of thinking you know all the possible causes of fainting because even if you do, You don't. Therein is wisdom. Possible causes of fainting. Trusting in self. In today's climate where people say, you must believe in yourself, and if you'll follow yourself and be true to yourself. And even the book of Proverbs says, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. And I'm not telling you to put aside confidence, but I'm telling you when it comes to the causes of fainting, trusting in self is up there. Second to that, neglect of prayer. The Lord said that men ought always to pray and faint not, but neglect of prayer usually comes by virtue of the following things. Laziness, I'm too tired to pray, Can you imagine treating your wife or your husband like that? You know what? I'm too tired to cook for you. I'm too tired to clean. I'm too tired to even tell you hi, hello. I don't even, I'm just too tired to look at you. (laughs) Can you imagine being married to somebody like that? Laziness. Pride. Oh, I don't need to pray. I prayed yesterday. I prayed last week. Again, let's go back to the spouse. Can you imagine you you don't talk to your spouse? Well, it's okay. I talked to her last week. (laughs) It's enough. Oh, she and I had a conversation last month. You just come and go. You see each other. You pass each other. You don't talk. It's really, it's, it's that crazy, but it's that true. Disobedience, as in we're told to pray in the Bible, Jesus instructing his disciples, but... I don't have to pray. God God knows my heart. I've heard people say that. God, I don't need that. Disobedience. Selfishness. A lack of desire to pray which stems from being out of step with God. Now, we all have days where, hard days, where the mind has been overtaken. But if this lack keeps growing, it is because you do not desire to even converse with God to petition him, which suggests an even deeper problem, which I won't get into right now. Next in line, so we have trusting the self, neglect of prayer, what I was just teaching out out of Hebrews, lack of hearing or dull ears, the inability, fainting, the inability to no longer have God's word affect you at all. Hardened, turned over, Calloused, believing a lie, and if believing a lie, damned. You might say, well, how are are these people, is there hope for these people? Well, I'm not their judge. That's between them and God. My job is to preach the word. The power that comes from that word, I have 
I have studied, I have lived, I have seen, and I have known, and I've also seen people with dull ears. They cannot hear, and they will rationalize. These are those that become super spiritual and rationalize, but they do not have a desire to press close. The next one that can cause fainting is looking at the long journey. You see, for some starting out, and maybe even for people that are in the middle of their journey, and they think, oh, the Lord will give me 70 or 80 or 90 years, and it's, it's going to be a long, long, long way. Your thinking is marred. You don't know what this afternoon or tomorrow will bring. Only God knows that. Instead of looking at how far the journey is, you focus your eyes on Christ, and every day you take a step closer to Him, and then things are put in perspective. But if not in perspective, fainting comes. I'm just so, I'm so burdened down, I'm so weary with the trip, but the Scripture says, He that endures to the end shall be saved. And then I build on this, which is the part B, the, the heaviness of the burden. Not only is the trip so long and I'm looking so far ahead, but man, the load I'm carrying is just about to break my back. Anybody ever said that? Come on now, be honest. The load I'm carrying is going to break me. I can't, I can't carry it anymore. That load may be comprised of Guilt, sin, things you wish in your mind, you know, are displeasing to God anyway. We're not talking about your condition. We're talking about the things you know you can't stop doing them. You want to, but you can't. Burdens of whatever you've carried, of baggage that you refuse absolutely to leave with God. This is why the relevance of understanding what happens when we're not paying close attention. We'll read by something, but fainting can come when we think the load is so heavy. What did Jesus say? Come unto me, all ye that are what? Mm, right. So what did I just say about God? He is understanding. No one can fathom. He knows. And it's perfect human nature. Preach the gospel. Tell people to bring their cares, casting your cares upon him, for he he cares about you. It matters to him. And yet, fainting, some saints are still fainting because the load is so heavy. Why do you think I said to you as a congregation, this is his work? There are many people in pulpits saying, my work, my this, my that. This is his work. I am not God. I'm just a frail, faltering person just like you, fading in him, being surrendered and used as a conduit for his purpose. And the reality is, if not seen in proper perspective, this is his work. You are his people. He put me here as the under-shepherd, the temporary steward for the time he has allotted for me, for which I do not know what that is. Now, if we have a right sense about ourselves, all the weight and the responsibility, but rather I recognize, and don't think I'm, oh, I don't do that. Sometimes I say, it's killing me. Then I'll come back to a passage like this and say, no, no, he's got the burden because it's his word, because it's his church, because you are his. I didn't birth you. Thank God I didn't birth you. (laughs) But he birthed you into the kingdom. You are his. Think about that. Possible causes for fainting. Sense of weakness from a lack of spiritual food, which you may say, well, that goes back to a lack of hearing in some cases. But in other cases, and I can give you some scriptural idea about this, in picture type, this happened to Gideon's men. He was with those 300 men. And they were hungry for real bread. They were hungry. They hungered. 
And as they came through a certain place, they asked for bread, and the men there would not feed them. You know what Gideon said, when we come back, you're toast. We want bread, but you're going to be toast. (laughs) Now, we are in a battle, and we may faint if we're not feasting on that bread, which is Christ. So when I say a lack of spiritual food, there are many people who have developed a taste for what they think is spiritual, but it's junk food. And then fainting comes, troubles come, situations come, and there is no sustenance to sustain. There is no ability to stand. There is no strength. There is no power. There is no hope. Why? Because the body, the spiritual body, has been fed junk food that is profitable for nothing except a bigger pair of spiritual pants, maybe. (laughs) Just saying. Lastly, in this list of things that may cause fainting, adversity, trouble, and infirmity. It's hard to wrap our minds around God. Now, go back for a minute to these people in captivity that God had a purpose for for letting these people be carried away into captivity. He had a purpose. Just like Joseph, I've said, was in prison for a purpose. The prison, that he, the, the prison that he was in wasn't because he committed a crime. God had him there that eventually he would spare and save his brethren and that nation. There was a purpose behind it. So likewise, trouble comes. Now whether the devil brings trouble, whether you made the trouble. Now let's be honest here, honesty time. We spend a lot of time saying, well, the devil did that, and the devil did that too. Oh, and the Lord, he's laying this on me. But how many times has trouble come upon you by your own doing? (laughs) Right. And then we want to go, oh, right? I, I, I can't tell you how many times in close proximity... The concept of fainting under things that I have actually brought upon myself. And then I pray, God, deliver me from this attack. But it was me. I did this. Another fine mess I got myself into, right? But here's the beautiful thing in all of this, even with adversity. We know that if we take the chastening that comes... And whether the chastening comes from the Lord and it is designed to train us, or whether these are temptations where Satan comes to tempt us and we are more than overcomers, we are equipped to resist the wiles of the devil, his schemes, his methods. But for a moment, let's say we lapse a little bit and we begin to become faint and weak. Then this passage becomes what I'd call a lifesaver. Now, it says here, speaking of God, that his, his strength, he does not grow tired or weary. I want you to remember that because those are going to be the same words applied to us except that which is our condition. We do become this way. Now, it says... In verse 29, he giveth power. God gives power. Let's talk about the power. We talked about fainting. Let's talk about the power. Now, there are many words in Hebrew for power. Instead of doing a Hebrew lesson or giving you Hebrew words, I'll just say it. But this particular word we're looking at is Koch. Koch. It's a hard thing to pronounce. I've spent weeks telling the people in the Hebrew class, pronounce that. So I had a bunch of people walking around like they were clearing their throats. It was really gross. But he gives power. And this particular power, there are many words for power in Hebrew. But this particular power, it struck a chord for me when I was researching and looking up this word that we know we read of Samson, how Samson was 
powerful. He was a strong man. Well, this particular word that I'm referencing is right there nestled into Samson's story. You know, the seductress Delilah, tell me your secret. And you know, it's a, it seems like a pretty, uh, when you read it or write, it seems like, wow, he was pretty dumb. I mean, he might have been really strong, but he was pretty dumb. You know, okay, I'm going to tell you the whole truth, the strength's in my hair. Really? <laughs> but if you don't read it like that, which I have lots of times, like, come on, Samson, really? There it is. Loose lips think ships. You want a, a proof text for that? There it is. But she lures him to fall asleep in her lap. Hmm, I wonder how she did that. And while he is asleep, don't go there. At least keep your mind on the Lord. While he is asleep, he, she has his seven locks cut off. He only had seven, I guess. Seven locks cut off, and that's it. And it says that while he was sleeping, the King James says, he wist not that the Lord had departed from him. Now, all the time that strength is mentioned before that time, it's this Hebrew word, koch. And then, of course, when he wakes up and she's busy, you know, testing to see if it's true, and sure enough, he says, his power is gone. The Lord had left him. That's the key there. The Lord had left him in the cutting of his hair. And this particular word that I'm referencing is significant because it, should, it suggests that God gave him this power. Although we can say he was a strong man, but it's obvious that when it says the Lord left him, this power, this koch, left him too. Now, it's interesting because the end of the story, when his hair starts to grow back, he gets the last moment to uh, collapse the, the temple and the pillars come down and all the people are destroyed there. But the initial point I want to drive is that this power that God gives is that power. He gives it. God gives the power. And if you, if you are going to study this to try and glean some and take away some strength out of this, many times you'll read this same word where it says the word for power, this word koch, where it says God gave the ability to give wealth. That's in Deuteronomy. This word ability is the same word, koch. He, he gives this to his own. A lot of times we say, well, we're okay. We can do this. We're strong. But we're talking to people about people who are bowed down now. They are crushed under the burden. They are fainting. For whatever the reason, all the things that I've mentioned, whatever it is, these are bowed down, weighted down for whatever the reason and fainting. To those, he gives that power. Now, if you don't go back, and that's why I read verses 12 through 31, if you don't go back and reread and so I read it in simple English. If you don't believe that God is God and that he is the creator from everlasting and all-powerful, then this will have no meaning to you. But if you believe that he will, God will not grow tired or weary, that his creative force spoke the world into being, put the stars in the sky, he named them, not one of them is lost, then... Surely he has the power to lift you up when you are bowed down. He has the power to give to you, to dispense to you, just like he did to Samson. And let's expand the territory, because I mentioned wealth, and I, I don't preach prosperity, but let's look at that. He gives the ability, he gives the power to get wealth, he says in Deuteronomy. I mean, so many of us try certain things on our own, but it's he, he, he is still the one dispensing in other places, it will be a diversity of power, but it comes from the same source. So to those fainting ones. And then let's add to this. And to them that have no might, he increases, increases strength. Now, it's a difficult thing to grab hold of because sometimes... While we are bowed down, we don't 
think God will empower, God will do this thing. And to those that have no might, now we have two words here, faint, might, actually three words, and strength, which are key. Now I'm going to skip over these because I want to get to a point and then I'll have to come back. In verse 30 it says, even the youths, the young men, even the youths shall faint, there's our word again, and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. Essentially, what that verse is saying is we may see, this is not to despise young people, but we may see young people who come into the church and they're, they're not battle-scarred, they're not burdened down, they haven't received the sense of tarnishment, of living, of a life full of reckless, void of... Wait, that'll come later on. But young youths, young persons... It says, essentially, if you want a right translation, even they shall faint eventually. You know, when the rambunctious ideas of youth actually start to peter off a little bit. And the young men, they too shall utterly fall. In essence, this is saying no human strength, even if it's one of youth and one powered by uh, vigor of youth, Eventually, it shall fail. Eventually, as long as you walk this road, you will become weary and you will faint. Eventually, it happens to each one of us. Not because I want to say, oh, here's the foreteller of gloom and despair. But if you're walking this path, it will happen. And for, for most of us here, if you reflect back on your younger years when you were stupid and careless and Well, we want to say carefree, but it's really careless. You ran like you were in a marathon. You, the, the idea of the church and Christianity, these were easy concepts. They weren't hard because life had not penetrated the thin crust of existing in a very cruel world. I know I can speak for myself, but I know I speak for most of you. Dr. Scott said it best, best, youth is wasted on youth. You remember that? Now, that's not to despise youth. That's simply to say that even here, the psalmist, I'm sorry, Isaiah is saying, this will happen. Let me read down. But they that wait upon the Lord. Because I've got to go back to he giveth power, but I need to finish the rest of this for it to make sense. So they that wait upon the Lord. These are the ones that he gives power to, the waiting ones. And it's a particular kind of waiting. It's an expectancy that God will do what he said. It's a knocking like that woman in the New Testament that kept knocking and knocking and knocking until finally he answered her. Waiting on the Lord. Now, how many of you have waited for something, and then you grow impatient with your waiting. Good, I'm glad there's there's more honest people than liars here. (laughs) Because it's hard to understand God's time. When the greatest sense of urgency was upon you and you were on your knees and the tears were flowing and you were crying and asking God, And then every day that passed that it seemed like God wasn't answering and God wasn't doing, did you start saying like these people, my way is hidden from the Lord? Surely he must not know. Or maybe you'll be like those that say, well, God's doing it for somebody else, but he's not doing it for me. Hey, wait a minute. Waiting upon the Lord means expectancy of God to do what he said. Now, either God is a liar... Or God is truth, and his word is true. And there's where you have to pick a side. Because if God's word is true and he is truth, then you go back to the first place of waiting, expectantly waiting on God to do that which he said. And in this case, the that which he said shall renew their strength. 
And this is an interesting one. He shall renew their strength. Guess what that word is? It's the same word as those when it says he gives power. Same word again. He shall renew their strength. Koch. Same word. I might as well write it for you so you know that I'm not hallucinating or coughing. <laughs> Koch looks like that. In one case, with a little furtive pata, as it's called. Koch. It says, they that are expectantly waiting upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. Koch, that, that, that is the strength that he gives. And I want you to put a footnote somewhere if you have not already. That word for renew, if you look that word up in the Hebrew, you've got a combination of things, but it's to renew, but it is also to change. That is, when I run out of my own, that is when God will put in his. You can't fight new battles with old strength. You can't live on last week's victories or last year's victories. Specific to each event. Now think about this. He changes, renews, changes their strength. That's the last part of this, and this seems anticlimactic, unbelievable. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Great, I'm going to be a bird. (laughs) But what that's really saying, they shall mount up. I want you to think of it this way. They shall soar. They shall soar. They shall be lifted above. It's not plural. The Hebrew reads a singular, like eagle's wing. I know that's a poor translation, but I want you to get a picture of something. Often, every time I've passed here, I've always thought of, they shall mount up and they shall... But the eagle is used in Scripture many times and referred to as swift, sometimes as the wing of deliverance, delivering the people, lifting them out, as God says he carried them out of Egypt's bondage on eagles' wings. Sometimes used in the scripture to show the brevity of life, how quickly, but again, it comes back to swiftness. And the idea here, as I said, it seems rather anticlimactic. We're, we're going to mount up in this position, and then we're going to run, and then we're going to walk. Now, if I was writing this, I'd do it the other way. I'd walk, I'd run, I'd fly, <laughs> right? But God's trying to say something here in a poetic prose for us to understand. Not everybody stays in a lifted above state, But the mounting up, let's just use the King James because until I do a translation, it'll be a little bit sloppy. But the mounting up like eagles with the wings, wing like the eagle's wing, is a pictorial way to say from the oppressed, weighted down, strengthless, we shall be endued to rise above the challenges. We shall be empowered God gives strength and might, strengthened with all might. Colossians 1.11 says it, and Ephesians 3.16 says it, and elsewhere in the New Testament. To rise up above the circumstances because God's word has empowered us to. When we say more than conquerors, it doesn't mean we constantly are living in the air as eagles with the bird's eye view, which some Christians think they have, looking down at everybody else, but rather that we are given the ability to soar swiftly above the circumstances, which we will not always stay there. Even the eagle must land at some point for rest, to renew again, to be able to take flight again. They shall run. And if this makes any sense to you, the idea of running 
is clearly put out in God's Word through David. The psalmist David, I will run the way of thy commandments when thou shalt enlarge my heart. You know, we read of people in the Bible who are running, and it seems like there's lots of people running all the time. Elijah's running ahead of Ahab's chariot to Jezreel. And the running competition between John and Peter to get to the tomb. How about Rebecca running to Eleazar? And these are all pictures of people running as, again, I taught on the word obedience, but that is running to God's word, for God's word, for God's purpose. So when it says, they shall run and not be weary, this is not a, don't get trapped in thinking now, all the saints of God are going to go out there and we're going to have a marathon in the street. We're talking about bowed down, despaired, crushed in spirit. To those people he gives power. To those that have no might, no vigor. Might is the same word being used in Job where it says the vigor has left his step. They have nothing left. To those people that wait upon the Lord with expectancy, he renews, he changes their strength, he gives them what they have, what they have exhausted, which was the source originally that came from him, not human strength. It came from him. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall, they shall soar, if you want to use key words, they shall soar above it all. They shall run and not be weary. The ability to, to run in God's way and in God's time trains us for something. You don't start running, by the way, just in the natural. You don't start running. Like, oh, today I'm going to go out running. And if you want to have a heart attack, you do that. <laughs> but even in the natural, you work up to it. You train for it. You, you walk. You walk a little faster. You walk a little longer. You train. You train. It is training to get up to that. Well, even in the spiritual realm, there's that same principle. In this case, it is running with the obedience and the training of God's word. And lastly, they shall walk and not faint. This is daily activity of the life of faith. This is why Paul says, walk in the spirit. Your feet shod with the gospel of peace, daily walking. Now, some would like to turn this upside down and say, fly, no. walk, run, fly. We have had moments, each of us, of seeing and experiencing God's deliverance. That makes our hearts and our souls soar in that picture sense, like God has touched me. I, this is not like I, I feel it, but I have known, I have seen, I have experienced in my life of faith. But you don't stay there. And running to his word. I use Psalm 119, verse 32, as I will run the way of thy commandments. And if you think about it, there's a whole lot of people running in the Bible, but except if you're Jonah and you're running away from God, most people are running to and toward God and to and toward his word. With the odd periodic time of running away, which we all, I think we all do, actually. We all do those moments of missing in action before God. Well, we think we're missing in action before God, but he sees it too. And the daily walking portion. So when people think about this, the walking is that steady, progressive progress that you are daily fading with God. The reality is that a lot of times out of this lesson today, I think we will say, yes, I know this promise, but truly thou art a God who hidest thyself because I've been waiting for power and I've been waiting to be soaring like the eagle and trying to run and I'm running around in circles most of the time and I'm barely able to walk. Well, let me go back to the fainting then. 
Because how can a person who is so burdened down, who does not believe that God is able to deliver, go to the what it seems like this, the most simple part of this walking is not, it's the most complex. How are you able to even walk and take another step if you're that burdened down? You see what I'm saying? So this passage not only offers comfort in the understanding that God knows, but if you are at the point where you can't take another step, where you have no might, no hope, no, there's nothing left, and yet you know you still are one of his. See, that's the, that's the disconnect. A lot of people might preach this message and say, well, of course, but then you probably aren't his because all of his are soaring, running, and walking. But there are a few people who are not able to do any of that. They've come to a halt this message is for you. Until God renews that, until you wait on him to renew that, and then you are given strength. You know the promise out of Deuteronomy 33, as thy days, so shall thy strength. Well, here we have another similar promise that says, as your strength is drained out, is gone, God's strength begins to be infused. While your patience may be tried in the waiting expectantly and hoping and latching on to, God is doing what he promised. Now, it's easy to say, but probably more difficult to put into practice. And there'll be some people who will hear and say, well, okay, I see all of this, but not come away with what I call the takeaway of this message, God's provision for his people. God has provided something for you. That God help the poor souls who don't reach into the book and say, I will appropriate this which he has promised. God help the ones that are still trying to say, well, I'll do it in my strength and you'll see, I'll get up again. Well, you can can have that fighting attitude. But if your strength doesn't come from him, don't even bother going out on the battlefield. The outcome is not going to be except what God says. The power that he has, never, it never lessens. When we read in the Bible and it says, I'm God and I change not, his strength is his strength, and it changes not. So the only thing I can conclude walking away from this, I said the takeaway part of this, is God in his great message to his first to his people, whom we know came out of captivity, whom we know were led to return to their land, whom we know God sent a messenger to encourage them. To us today, who may feel like we are living in our own land of captivity and don't understand why God maybe is hiding from us, or maybe we're hiding from him, but I'm telling you the promise is right here. For those who, who would like to say, I need this power, I'm burdened down. I'm so tired. I am not able to go any longer. To you who are bowed down, he gives power. It's his power. He dispenses it. And to those that have no might, your vigor, your everything that you once think you had is gone. Don't be looking at people around you saying, well, look at how they soar and look at how they run and look at their walk speaking to you in your condition. They that wait upon the Lord, expect him to do what he said. My question for you is, do you expect him to do that for you? Do you expect him to renew your strength? Do you expect him to lift you up, you who are bowed down? If you don't, if you're just kind of, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think God really is in the business of trying to lift people up who don't even know that they're so sagged down. They're saggy, loggy Christians. <laughs> now, in the book of Hebrews, it says lifting up feeble hands or arms. God is in the business of picking people up, not crushing them. 
and the act of faith and the anticipation of God performing his word is what I want to drive home. The provision for God's people is this. And you may say, well, I've been patient, but God hasn't yet done. The key word is wait with expectancy. Not wait as in, is it time yet? Is it over yet? Is it going to happen yet? But waiting expectantly. Now let me tell you a story about waiting expectantly and then I'm done. To the woman who saw Jesus, and she said within herself, if I could only just touch. She didn't say if he could only come and talk to me, if he could come shake my hand, if I could have five minutes with, if I could only just touch the hem of his garment, expectancy that something of divine power would come unto her, she would be touched and be healed. So why would we have anything different in our minds when the promise is right here? To those that are expectantly waiting upon the Lord, he shall change, he shall renew, he shall give you a new fresh infusion. Those who have prayed, I need your help, God. I'm bowed down. He is the lifter up of his people, the I am of this passage. And to those who understand that, you may not always be in the position of being above it all in your faith because you've risen to that point where God has said and you've seen it. Your soul has soared to see God's promise and God's word fulfilled. But then here comes another time where strength is now gone out again. And God does this. Seasons of strength to show you he is the provider and he's made provision Running to his word enables us to walk daily. And for each and every one of us, perhaps the desire to have just a closer walk with him. If you're bowed down, if you're about to faint, if you're weary, wait on the Lord. Expectantly wait on the Lord. He will give you power and renew your strength. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.